Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is, no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal, we do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. And I'm Robin, and this episode on Books That Burn, we are discussing Ptolemy's Gate by Jonathan Stroud. From the publisher, we have the book description. Ptolemy's Gate is the climax of the Bartimaeus trilogy in which a long-standing conspiracy comes to fruition and Bartimaeus, Nathaniel, and Kitty face a final enemy which threatens them all. I love it when these synopses are short and sweet and don't spoil the other books of the series. That's always nice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. For our first topic, we have colonization. Now, uh, in case you aren't already aware, this is book three of a trilogy. So we're going to spoil stuff for the whole trilogy, not on purpose, but just incidentally. Yeah. Um, Like, that Bartimaeus, Nathaniel, and Kitty have a common enemy is already vaguely a spoiler. And arguably also the prequel, even though it was written after these. So go into this assuming that you will hear things about what happens in the other three books. Yeah. So, uh, Colonization. Uh, This is a book about... This is a series about... um, magicians and empire specifically in this trilogy the british empire yeah and there's this uh narratively lovely thing that is not great for the characters involved in it where they keep referring to the american campaign and that is british magicians fighting indigenous magicians in the americas yeah i have no idea whether the american revolution is a thing at all i didn't get the feeling Uh, that it is it seems like it seems like it's pre pre pre-revolution or they've got computers they've got computers so it's not pre-revolution it's it's, revolution didn't happen yeah it's it's alternate universe earth in any case even without the magic um yeah yeah i i do like that they have computers but also like modern tailoring and stuff yeah well they have computers and cell phones and i hadn't realized that when i was a kid i thought this was set much earlier (laughs) um but regardless of the actual year i mean we know it's post gladstone but you know I'm right. not British, and so that has much little, much less weight in my head to help anchor me in time than it would for someone where, like, this is maybe mm. referencing, like, a specific actual part of British history. So anyway, that they have cell phones anchored me the most. I'm like, oh, okay, this is probably when the books came out, which was the early 2000s. 
Right. Like, alternate universe that. So anyway, uh, colonization is part of the project of empire and is, fact, how you end up with an empire. And I really like the synergy between this kind of thing, like, burbling in the background, where it doesn't let the characters ever have the excuse in a meaningful way mm-hmm. of saying, oh, well, we, we did all that in the past, but, like, it's <laughs> fine now. No, no. Our our um our POV character is incredibly loud <laughs> about how you did it before, you're still doing it, you've never apologized. This is part of the cycle of empires across the mm-hmm. fictional world. And it always happens this way. And of course you're still doing it. And no, it's not better this time. Like, um, Bartimaeus is uh, cynically enthusiastic about tripping Nathaniel up with his own history knowledge. And Mm -hmm. it's in a way that really never lets the the reader kind of off the hook of what's happening. Yeah, like, um, we'll we... I think I think this fits here and not in topic three. Like one of the things with I was gonna say that Nathaniel keeps using the threat of sending Bartimaeus to fight in the American oh, campaign yeah. to try and get him to do stuff. So like the the oppression at home is enmeshed and feeding into in the cyclical way with the colonization and efforts of empire abroad. Yeah. Like it's yeah. all part of one big project. Right. Um, in a way that, again, I did not appreciate or realize when I was a teenager and actually meant that I was like slightly trepidatious when Nicole, you wanted to do the series. Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, Oh no, I love these books as a kid. I <laughs> understand colonization now. What if this, doesn't actually engage with that topic. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. No, it, All it right. very it, it does. slams you over like, the head with this topic in a positive like, way from a reader perspective. Yeah, because because I was a little bit about worried about like oh no like because yeah. I, I think British I, author using folklore <laughs> from another bit of the world. And it's like oh well, you can feel whatever way about that. Yeah. But once we're doing that, it's done in a way that speaks to that to in a the way problems, yeah yeah to the problems and in, inherent in yeah because I, I suggested this i think thing. i think even maybe in our first round of books and and you vetoed and that was fine um yeah but yeah so like four years ago yeah yeah but that was why that was why I was hesitant is because I was like, oh, no, right. I would like to for slightly longer have my lovely memories of liking <laughs> this series. And I got to the that end. I'm like, news. Oh. <laughs> um, no, th- this still worked out. Yeah, no, this is very much a book that is told from a fictional British standpoint. Um, but in a way that in the f- fictional universe, again, and the fictional representation of things, crimes committed and things done does not let Britain off the hook even a little bit and also Mm -hmm. incriminates the cultures pre-Britain that in, again, in the fictional representation uh, committed similar crimes. It is very, very loud about how none of this is okay. And yet you keep doing it because you can't handle not having power over other people just over and over and over and over and over. (laughs) Yeah. Like, um, I think it's the, prologue to this one Mm -hmm. is is it him working on the no that's the pre that's the prologue to the second one is bartimaeus working on the wall in prague yeah that's prologue and then there's yeah prologue to the second one um shows him in the past with the at the tail end of the previous big empire's power like prague is still around Mm -hmm. The existence of Prague. Oh no! I think this is, is the this is this book because we get Gladstone preface to Gladstone story. Ah, uh, pretty yes. sure. Okay, yeah. So it might be this one. Regardless, because it in this was. Trilogy. Oh no! Now I'm not sure because I'm trying to remember if we had the context for the golems before <laughs> or I don't know. I'm sure. No, because I think I think we get the 
Because that's in Prague with the golems. I right. think we get the context for the golems because it's Gladstone's army that is coming to Prague. We're talking about the same thing. I was just thinking about it from the perspective. Okay, of no, I think Artemis that is book two was, then. Yeah, that's with book Gladstone's two. army yeah. coming. Yeah, because in book three we get flashbacks with Ptolemy. Okay, anyways, yes, moving on. Yeah. Um. So with that, uh, the the trilogy is very much highlighting how much, yeah, it's a cycle of abuse of power, and people keep doing this. Yeah. But part of why in this trilogy we wanted to talk about this third book rather than one of the others is because with the discussion of Ptolemy, we get the idea of like an attempt at another way. And we'll right. elaborate on this Three. later. But I think it's relevant in our colonization section right. to talk about how this attempt at another way the best possible version of this attempt at another way, which genuinely did happen in Bartimaeus's past, mm-hmm. still doesn't work. It's not really because equal. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't fix things. It isn't better letting humans into the other place is no better for humans than it is for demons to come to this place. Uh, I would argue it's uh, worse. Yeah, I was going to... I trying not to spoil that but whatever well, I, yeah, I think no, that's important it's, though i think that's a yeah that's it, a, a context yeah, that matters well um, then yeah so no it's it's definitely worse in a way where an individual um you can't an individual <laughs> i don't want to call them demons because they don't want to be called demons but there isn't another jinn is there yeah but that's just bartimaeus's class that's not all the other that's not like marriage and spirits is what i think they get okay yeah spirits yeah so they call themselves so to speak i was like i spent so much time saying don't call me demon i'm like wait what's the other word what's the the other option you didn't tell it what are the other options is okay no bartimaeus Um, would say the other option is to select specifically call out the class of spirit that oh, they that's are true Barnabas say you better have enough knowledge to Bar- exactly yeah Barnabas would say you better about. have done your homework and bothered to care enough about this to be accurate and also you know how dare you put me on a level with anyone below me and they don't want to be and the people above me don't want to be on my level so you can't call us all together <laughs> that would be the answer <laughs> that's true you're right that probably would be his answer um and might I think even spirits, be his though. answer somewhere in the book okay that's yeah, the spirits. one that we we see in the book that's neutral and everybody yeah, so when a human goes to the other place, it either will kill them or take a large chunk of their life and mess up their body. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so they can, you could survive one trip, you can't survive a second one. If you're lucky, you survive one trip. Right. Yeah. Um. But part of the inherent in it I, I, so i'm talking about this here because i'm thinking about it as the idea mm. of the spirits being pulled because of colonial efforts to this world or a human if humans went in mass to the other place it would be because of an attempted colonization which <laughs> my must my um my thought process for wanting to talk about this here uh, i see it wouldn't just put so them you in know, power it wouldn't right, put just, them in power so they wouldn't bother anyway right that's so you know why i'm talking about this now right. and not at another spot um because that matters so if the humans wanted to do that one magicians still wouldn't go they'd right. send it's somebody else like they they'd find more of a somebody else to send <laughs> and it's not going to happen because the only way for a human to travel to the other place involves completely trusting one of the spirits. Yeah. And that's not as a group going to happen. And I thought it was very interesting that one of the things with all this colonial paradigm is the idea that you can't, because of inequalities built into the system, in I mean, and this is where the system was set by up by the author to prompt these thoughts. Right. Um, because of the way the system is, there isn't a way for it to become equal. Right. And so the best that you can have 
is a strong bond and trust between one human and one spirit. Right. But you can't, you can't commodify it, <laughs> which is an important lesson in the series. Yeah. Um, because trying to commodify is a project of colonization and subjugation and some of the other stuff we're going to talk about. And I think also it's important on that note to note that not only do you have to trust the spirit calling you, but mm-hmm. they have to invite you. <laughs> There's yes. no way to get to the other place through force. Um, yes. Which is not true of Prague, the Americas, etc., 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 etc. Right. It's not true of the places where magicians are using the spirits right. to conquer and subjugate and continue colonization. Right. Um, but I think that that's a nice... Because we, I just wanted to highlight that because forcibly mm-hmm. calling a spirit to our world in the book is is how it happens. Um, yep. That is how that system is set up. But you can't force your way over there. It has to be through consent on your own part and also the person, the spirit summoning you. There's no halfway to, way to do that. It does make me wonder from a world building perspective, how any of this couldn't could have started if you have to know a name in order to call them over. But also Bartimaeus <laughs> does talk about the idea that they were that magicians through calling them gave them names. And yeah. so it seems it seems like it's a bit of a hand wave. I've said enough, please don't please don't <laughs> worry too much about it. Well we're several thousand years on. I don't I don't think it's okay, here's my head canon. I don't think mm-hmm. it's that you have to have a name to call the spirit. I th- because they have multiple names. I think that in order oh, to call yeah. a precise spirit that has been named, using their name will get you that one. Ah. I think it's that because as Bartimaeus says, we don't have names in the other place. We don't care uh-huh. about things like that. I think that the limitation set on the spirit as it is pulled is partially given by their name Mm -hmm. and that it was a system set up but naming them defines the name and not figuring out the name that doesn't exist yeah that fits that makes sense i realized that was like not the most coherent sentence (laughs) um Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't think I don't think it has anything to do with them and their being in the other place. I think it is 100 percent defined by pulling them through and how humans defined that spirit the first time it was called via the name. Yeah, because definitely with some of the the types of spirits that are below Jenny, that they aren't called on an individual name basis. It, it seems. Like, you summon, I would like a bunch of imps, please. <laughs> I don't, like, and that's the vibe I get, but I'm not totally sure. Right. Uh, regardless, um, it's time for our next topic. <music> On to classism. Okay, so, when you've got colonialism... That's often intertwined with colonialism abroad and classism at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the synergy of the bad stuff is very high in the world building for this series. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the class structure that we encounter because we're in kind of like the magician focused side Mm -hmm. of the class structure, there's magicians and commoners um can within I, that can I especially speaking of new kitty's perspective we have like a little bit more nuance but what did what do you want to look up oh i was gonna just add that there's I th- it sounds like you're maybe going to get there from a commoner perspective go ahead i i was gonna say that we we start out with it being like magicians commoners and then by the time it's this third book we've got like you know there's there's some who work some commoners who work with magicians willingly there are magicians who aren't seen highly by their other magicians and are like totally fine being around commoners as long as they're not thought of 
as one of them. We do encounter one of those um, that Kitty ends up working with. Um, and then there's people who, like Jacob's family, who provide a service for the magicians and kind of like, so there, there's stuff with um, the ways that being an immigrant plays into different things. Like there's a, there's a lot of class complexity um, in what starts out as a very simple paradigm in the first book, partly because Nathaniel is like 12 in the first book. And as his understanding and Kitty's around the same age, as her understanding of what's going on grows, then Bartimaeus has more complicated, snarky things to be able to play off of. Um, I apologize if any of Princess's cries for something come through the mic. Um. <laughs> huh? Discord filtered them, so we'll okay. see on the final recording. Yeah, that isn't always true about... So, did I get to your point, or do you uh, have it separately? You, you set it up really nicely. I was gonna, ah, cool. I was going to just say that um, definitely in the first book, I, I agree, it's very... Nathaniel only knows what he cares about, which is mute magician, good, common, or bad. Um, and he's 12. He's or, currently... Or, no, that's not true. Magician, yeah. good, and always correct common or bad unless they're helping you <laughs> mm-hmm. and <laughs> that's, he's 12 that's it he's currently being indoctrinated and so part of the trajectory of the trilogy yes. is that we like, get the path of his indoctrination yes. and like the way this classes the classist ideas stew within him and make him a rather terrible person in book two and doing a lot of work to try and overcome those biases in book three i i'm well, sure this came up when we were discussing uglies but i mm-hmm. love books where it's the same character but oh yeah you did talk the about way this. they narrate is transformed across um a series i i know i talked about this when we did the, yeah for sure the ugly series but also nicole i regret to inform you that was at least two years ago <laughs> Oh no. So, <laughs> it's been a while. Maybe not all of the audience has Hopefully. has uh, partaken of those episodes. That's um, possible. Hopefully yeah. it's someone's first episode. No, so so that's book 1. Book 2, we get this mm-hmm. really nice strata of the magician hier- hierarchy. And the yes. thing this is this is something that I really like how this is done because uh so there's a thing <laughs> In any kind of um, oppression in general, whether it's mm-hmm. homophobia or classism or racism or whatever, what have you. Um, uh, I can't speak to anti-Semitism, but anyways, the ones that I'm more familiar with. Um, there's a thing that happens a lot of the time, which is this this strata of acceptable and also unacceptable. There are different ways to kind of you know, there's the people who are unacceptable, but eh, they're kind of close enough because they are they have some ideals of things that, you know, you could in the right circumstances have been acceptable. And so they're just better. And you have in your strata of acceptable, you have the people who, if they really weren't acceptable, then they would clearly go in the other class. But they have things that are not close enough but by virtue of still being in the acceptable class, they're still kind of looked down on. (laughs) Um, And so you have this weird, like almost infighting thing that happens at both levels or more than one, all three levels or however many levels you have of trying to be close enough to acceptable or prove that you've earned your place. And this book series does a very good job of outlining that whether or not our characters are currently participating. Um, Mm -hmm. Kitty is a really good example of a character who just says, F this, I don't care. This has nothing to do with me and I don't like it and I don't like the entire system. I'm not trying to be accepted. I'm just trying to live my life and you have made that impossible and so I will retaliate. Um, Bartimaeus starts out as somebody who said, well, I've started as unacceptable by association with my master and I want to earn my place. I want to prove that I've earned my place in a way that gives me power over others. 
And then eventually by book three, he's kind of said, you know what, never mind, this isn't worth anything, and I hate it. But it's not I hate the system, it's I hate where I am, but I just can't get any, mm-hmm. nothing I do is helping, so I don't actually care anymore. And then eventually, eventually he kind of gets to the point where the very limited way he can see the actual systemic problem but by then spoilers and it doesn't matter (laughs) it's too late (laughs) but also the system doesn't exist because reasons um (laughs) but but i think so i just want to just walk through that that progression because i think it's really well illustrated Mm -hmm. and in book one we only get nathaniel's understanding for human beings which is as i said before magician good common or bad magician good unless something common or bad unless they're helping magician right and i i do have a little super quick thought about him in book one because uh-huh. he is so enmeshed in that that he just says to miss lechen's face about how oh, yeah. commoners are all terrible and then partway through the conversation he like realizes that he's saying this to a commoner and to a and commoner causes- that he likes and respects and cares and about it- like it yeah. causes him some cognitive dissonance for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, because he's like, wait, I like you and you're like helpful <laughs> right. and stuff. Maybe commoners aren't all uh terrible and stupid. Or or maybe I'm a terrible mu- magician for liking you. There's mm, he has right, kind of both right. moments of maybe, maybe commoners aren't all traitor. terrible and maybe it's me. I'm terrible. Maybe I'm a class traitor. Like maybe it's awful. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Um yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> um, so book two, we see the magician strata. Book two, we see the magician strata. We see the people who are unacceptable, but they're still acceptable because they fit in our class structure and they they did the right thing, they're a magician, to be in the upper level of the class structure. But if the other other magicians could warrant it, they would kick them down to commoner. Because something about them is just not acceptable. No one likes Julius Tallow. <laughs> no one likes Julius Tallow. <laughs> probably because of his personality. But <laughs> the thing well, is... Probably. But, or or well, actually... It's partly, it's also... It's also because um, he messed up. It's also he because he injured. messed up. <laughs> yes. So there's some like ableism. And I'm, oh, I'm trying to remember even, the term. You know what? I, I want to argue. I don't even think it's ableism. Because I'm I don't tr- think I'm it, trying to get it doesn't right impact term. him in any way. His skin is just discolored. Yeah, it doesn't no, actually the... do anything. It's just a visual reminder that the creatures that they are exerting power over are not actually under their control. And people don't like that. They don't like the idea that, oh, that could happen to me. And, oh, yeah, magicians die doing this. There, There's that. I'm, a... I, I'm, ableism isn't quite the right word. No. There's, I, I know there's a term for... Mm-hmm. Um, for a related dislike of um ugliness or lack of oh, beauty yeah. and i think the that, ostracization I I also that he can't has remember the name for it but I, you're right it is that one but it's not yeah it's not actually i don't think it, it's, it's, I would argue, it's I don't related think it's ableism. to um there's aesthetic components of ableism that intersect with it without right. quite technically being the same thing anyway right that's what we're talking about that's what he has he yeah. and also <laughs> Because he is his he's terrible and his personality is very odious, but I suspect, but don't know that the magicians were totally fine with him before he messed up one of these spells because right. it 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 scares them right and makes them feel like it makes them feel like they could mess up in a way that would they hurt could them be next. But part of how they deal with that in a structural way mm-hmm. is to say that that'll only happen to you if you're incompetent or bad. Right. And of course, in each case, the speaker doesn't consider that they c- cannot allow themselves to consider well, that they could be incompetent well, or it's, bad. It's specifically that if you're incompetent, it means that you uh, either one of the two are a not a real magician because you messed up or B uh, shouldn't be a real magician. <laughs> Right. Depending right. on the conversation that is in the commentary that is currently happening, specifically around this character, it's one of the two. It's either you're not a real one of us, or you shouldn't be, because if you were real, then you wouldn't make a mistake. And mm-hmm. it, th- so you kind have an- that. And Nathaniel does a very good job of commentating internally and kind of outlining 
how that dichotomy of like you have to be the best accepted to be real and if there's something quote unquote wrong with you like well we can't kick you out but we don't really we're not going to help you <laughs> um yeah like in book the 2 instant, the instant you mess up then you weren't a real one kind of like a yeah. it's you didn't related really to the no power. true related to the no true scotsman fallacy <laughs> thing um yeah. where uh, anyway like defining a group either in a way that you can't escape being in the group or it's impossible right. there, there's no bad ones in the group <laughs> yeah exactly because like, otherwise bad, our power structure would fall apart and we would have to think about this and we can't do that and then in book three, uh, oh, I also really like, I just want to side note before I go to book three, uh, I really enjoy how it's set up because Nathaniel is one of the good ones, but he has to, he still has to prove himself because his master was not one of the good ones <laughs> and his master was right. incompetent and terrible. And so Nathaniel doesn't actually have to prove himself. He has to prove that he's no longer associated with his old master. Mm -hmm. He has to prove that he, it doesn't matter that he started there, that he's still his own person, kind of, um, which is fun. And then in book three, we get from, from mostly from Kitty and some from Jacob, but for, through filtered through Kitty's eyes, we get this, the, the commoner strata of all the way from hates the musicians, hates the structure, wants nothing to do with it, and is actively trying to push back against it all the way up to the commoners who make their books and write their spells and d create all of the things that allow them to actually live their lives without being like workmen um allow them to only be magicians and not also printers um so you have this like this those layers there and it's it's really it's just really well done and it really as somebody who read these books in, I think, middle school. Um, it's a really quick, good, thorough, like, here's how this can happen. <laughs> and this is why it's bad for everybody involved. You know, the magicians at the top benefit, but also it's not really a good thing for even them. It's really just kind of terrible for everybody. And the people at the top are just obsessed with staying there and they don't even get to really function, live. <laughs> And the people at the bottom end up disabled, murdered, betrayed, <laughs> you know, starved, beaten, what what have you. Um, and I'm not I'm not labeling disable um uh, disability in there as a the thing that happens, but it's an explicit in this it context. Is a it is explicit explicitly associated with somebody hurt you, a magician hurt you, and you deserved it, and so you have to live this way. Right. Or yeah. So the classism kick you out of the magician um, group. In at least one very particular case, gets entwined with ableism. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of what happened to Jacob. Yeah. Um. Because and and what that... what quote unquote should have happened to Kitty, like to the uh -huh. point where the fact that she doesn't come out with a lifelong disability from this thing, they call her a liar and tell her that it didn't happen and that they don't believe her and that they try to literally take everything that her family has from her, like. Yeah, it's very so it, explicitly a commentary on this a little bit as well, but not in the same way. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and so where where the the ableism comes into play under time with the classism is it's like, oh, that a demon has physically marked you in a way that other people can see whether or yeah. not it it actually impedes your function is treated in ways similar to how um, something that does impede function mm -hmm. would be treated in an ableist way by society. Um, there, it's treated as kind of like, that is bad and they're kind of equally bad, but one of them is a sign that the people in power decided that you were right. in their way and should have gotten out of it faster. Right. And, and so, like, other people will see it and be like afraid or concerned or like oh well you know you got you got what you should have you shouldn't have mm -hmm. done this thing that a magician 
uh, didn't like one time. Right. And so they use ableism and then, oh my God, I cannot remember what the term is for like the beauty related stigma. I'm going to try and find it. One sec. Yeah. But it, um, those two intertwine to help reinforce the class structure rules. Yeah, well, and and also there's there's an explicit, Jacob and Kitty have a conversation about this at one point, there's Mm -hmm. an explicit um, victim blaming that happens where if you were injured by a spirit, then it's your fault that you live like this and it's your fault that you, in our one character's case, can't see that you are now blind entirely. Like, you should have done better or been better. He can see shadows. He could basically see light and dark. That's about it. Okay. Um, Yeah. And, like, the the marbling on his skin doesn't really do anything. Doesn't impede him in any way. It doesn't hurt or it itches when it's healing and that's it. But, yeah, he explicitly loses functional sight. Yeah. He he referred to the marbling on his skin in a way that had given me the impression that he could still see but uh, oh. i guess other that's why i didn't mm. think that he'd lost his sight regardless no, because there's he... a there's a scene where he could tell that the light is turned on um and that's basically it and he yeah. knows that he was flying kind of through the air because he wasn't touching ground and then he's assuming it's a different place because it smells different and the light is hitting him different and that's that's basically all he gives off yeah, I had thought that was just immediate recovering in the long term he could see again, but I might be wrong about that. I don't know that Regardless, we get a long term that really. Isn't, yeah. That isn't a that isn't a focus. Well, no, because when he's Does, taken, it's a couple years later. So it's explicitly long term. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyways. Um so the, the the point with this that I'm trying to make is that it's it's uh the ableism that we see really in the book comes in the form of victim blaming because the the disabled characters that we see are the ones who have been injured at the behest of magicians explicitly. We don't really get any other examples. Um, and and so it's kind of taken to this level of like, if you if you are injured, if you have a disability because of this thing, then it's your fault and you should have done better. And also, we have to ostracize you. We can't hang out with you. We can't be seen with you because then the magicians will A, know that you are a problem and B, implicitly assume that we are going to quote unquote misbehave as well. It's a very... Oh, uh, I found the answer. According to TV Trips, Jacob is severely disfigured but temporarily blinded. The blindness is temporary. Temporarily blinded? I thought because like... um there were the way Bartimaeus interacted with him made me think he could see and anyway TV trip says the blindness was temporary um anyway well that's weirdly inconsistent then but okay no because he is explicitly kidnapped a few years after the incident and he still can't function no he he's agoraphobic that's how I read it he could well, leave. He's his family's like he's ostracized. His fam- well, his family's like you could go out of the house, and he's like, "Nope, I well, will yeah. not." No, because I will be <laughs> hurt again. Yeah, no, no, completely understandable, but not due to blindness. Regardless, uh, I'll have to read that scene again. So I was fairly certain that it was. It basically took the blindfold off. Oh wait, that didn't really matter because you can't really tell anyway. No, that that is. I see how you. That doesn't fit at all with my reading of it at all in any of the times. Uh, regardless, uh, I think that we should get to our third thing because there's even more cool stuff. And by cool, I mean a different topic of trauma <laughs> to, to discuss <laughs> for this. <laughs> On to our final topic, which is torture. Uh, <laughs> we are so you said that. Our final topic is torture. Deep voice. Uh, we are specifically talking about 
uh, Bartimaeus and how the other spirits are treated, but like specifically Bartimaeus while recognizing that he is an example of this happening writ large to him and a lot of other spirits too. We debated whether to have the topic be torture or slavery, and the reason we went with torture (laughs) is because of the paradigm where this isn't a some masters are cool and fine and they're basically friends and for some of them it's bad like be- well, we also the- we also threw physical abuse in there like we had three options and we had to figure out how to yeah thread that needle so that we got to talk about something that we wanted to talk about yep and the reason that um i at least um i'm sure nicole maybe had other reasons for agreeing too but the reason <laughs> that I wanted to have torture be the topic is because literally summoning a spirit to the physical plane confines and hurts them, making it so that there isn't a version of this that is pleasant for both parties. There can't be. Um, They could have a master whose only thing that is asked of the spirit is literally to come to this plane and they have caused them pain and are causing them pain for every instant until they return. Um, Now in this book, we do have uh, rather um, dramatically uh, an attempt to get around this, to have a way for them to exist and not, be in pain Mm -hmm. um that appears to come with (laughs) a uh with mental deterioration well um uh, mental deterioration and also it doesn't actually work long term and also yeah it generally kills the human there's legitimate debate among the other spirits of whether the mental deterioration comes from one being trapped on earth this long or two being encased in the bones yeah like like, we we don't even know we don't know, but what we do know is that this isn't actually a solution, which I think is the mm-hmm. most important thing, is to say, we understand that the book has this, but part of the point of it showing up is that this doesn't actually work long term. Yeah. Also, um, I just found, and if we could find a way to integrate this, maybe, <laughs> into okay. uh, our episode, we will. Um uh, I love when Google autofills a meme. <laughs> All I had to do to find oh this God. meme was type in ow, oof, ouch, and it went ow, oof, ouch, my bones. Okay, I will, I will see. I will <laughs> see what I can do. Uh, <laughs> but because we are a <laughs> podcast. Uh-huh. Um, and we, I just, think this, we just got rid of Twitter. Uh, Cutting I'm out the toxicity Tumblr. in our lives. I'm on Tumblr. <gasps> I will see what we can yes, do Yes, that's a good okay. medium for this. That's So, uh, you'll be able to see that at some point in the past, uh, I put this on Tumblr. Tumblr. Does that mean I tumbled it? Is that it? No. Is that how it works? It means you re- rebageled it. But no, but I, I'm not, this isn't reblogging if I'm the one who puts it on there. Oh. that That's just posting. Mm. I know about reblogging. Okay, regardless, <laughs> this is not a podcast about how I'm slowly navigating losing using that yeah. not losing Tumblr. Using Tumblr. <laughs> uh, I just I just want to This do- is a pod <laughs> this is a podcast about a book in which someone has the black Tumblr used on them. Hey, I uh, got us uh, back hey. to the episode. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I just wanna I just thought of the, the meme because when Heranius is touched with the silver, he's like, Ah, pain, why? Yep. How dare you? No, no, no! Don't worry. I understood why. Uh, yeah, why you did that. Um, there isn't a non-painful and non-distressing way t- for a spirit to exist on the physical plane. At least, not one that they found out that doesn't leave uh one party or the other in a very precarious position. Um, Nathaniel right. and Bartimaeus work out a thing, but if Bartima- Bartimaeus wanted to, he could crush Nathaniel. Um, uh, just well, pinch out Nathan- his spirit. Yeah, just like eh, that. But also, in the um, general theme of 
hey, so you should probably find another way because this entire system is toxic and bad for literally everyone. Uh, if he did that, it would actually be worse for him pretty quickly. We have a lot right. of examples of that, which I appreciated. Um, so I think with like the torture and pain and like, also, like, specific punishments are also a thing right. throughout the trilogy and also specifically in the third book. We also get, like, a pretty explicit thing of, like, slightly intertangling with classism among the spirits where Bartimaeus has a bad day and get because he gets punished by his master and or isn't getting dismissed and so is in excruciating pain because it's been too long since he got to go back to the other place. And so he squishes a few imps because <laughs> he needs to let off some steam. I think that happens more in the second book. That happens several times. Yeah, like, it's not limited to the second book, but I think there were more of them in that one. All right, hopefully I edit out that sound from the recording. Uh, Haku has been just a pest today because she desperately wants to get fed and she just can't handle it today more than other days and so she uh knocked my books over by rubbing her face on them and crying <laughs> and it definitely got picked up by the discord or by uh, audacity <sighs> struggling today all right anyways but yeah i so this is the main trauma we picked for the book because it's so uh constant and ever present in a bunch of different ways um and yeah it's everything from like the ambient low level of just increasing pain for every moment that bartimaeus is around to narrate things for us he is in pain and being hurt and sometimes he's literally being tortured for information. Sometimes he's being punished because Nathaniel is upset that a thing didn't happen. He's being threatened with getting put into war zone, uh, the American campaign, as we mentioned in the first topic. Well, oh, There's no, just we should note mm -hmm. he does not get physically punished with um, spells at all. That does not happen. And it's very important that that doesn't happen for uh, knowledge base reasons. Oh, sorry. So. It happened... Uh, it happens to other, other creatures. Um, and he does it to other people, other spirits. But he cannot have it happen by, uh, by Nathaniel. So he gets threatened with it? I thought Nathaniel heard him in the first book, like, once. Uh, he, he No, he, he literally never got the opportunity. Okay. He tried. And also Nathaniel like generally vaguely threatens it to the group that he's ordering around. But <laughs> Bartimaeus just kind of gives him like a, a a taunting wink like, mm, well, you know, that will happen to me, right? Because you can't, right? Yo, that's true. Well, yeah, because he, he can't for, he can't because uh, Bartimaeus is also calling him Nathaniel. Um, because that's not his magic name. That's his secret name. That's the right. secret name that can hurt him. Uh, as a side note, that meant that when reviewing these books, it was interesting deciding whether I needed a content warning for dead naming, which I ultimately <laughs> only went with for one of the reviews, because it only played out that sure. way in one of I the guess. books. Anyway. That's really funny. I hadn't actually thought of it that way. No, like, I absolutely, in the first book, I put a content warning for dead naming because that's completely what's happening there. Yeah. The threat of revealing a part of your identity to other people in a way meant to cause social and or emotional <laughs> distress. <laughs> that's what dead naming that's is. That's so funny. That happened. So, <laughs> so anyway. That, that's so funny because this is the, this is the, the information equivalent of somebody has a gun on you so you pull a knife on them like you're right you're still right <laughs> this is allowed but also yeah that's hilarious <laughs> not nah, like he he's not trans that's not what's happening R um, right and and he is the one in power and actively oppressing bartimaeus and his right. his kin 
but it's justified. Also, but, but also, he is being threatened with dead naming that's as so a retaliation. Good. That is absolutely the dynamic that's happening, especially in the first book. That's amazing. By the time it was the later books, it wasn't in a way that made me think it needed to be a content warning. But for the first one, absolutely. No question. That's totally what's happening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of, I don't know, it, it you know, one of the interesting lessons of uh being uh a person is that i i am part of a bunch of different kinds of people and some people suck and so sometimes people in those categories suck right <laughs> and in this i don't know he he sucks that doesn't mean he's immune to being threatened with dead naming uh <laughs> Anyway, uh, but yeah, so the the that Bartimaeus has this information is part of what you're right is part of what keeps him from being effectively uh, punished uh, by Nathaniel, and so the only thing that he can do, so the only thing Nathaniel can do to punish Bartimaeus is to threaten him with changing the way that he is summoned. Right. Which is part of why the thing with the American campaign is such a a effective threat, because he's threatening to put him far enough in a way that it'll be hard for it to matter that Bartimaeus has this leverage. Right. And so right. even if he carries out the threat, well, someone would have to care enough to get that information back across the ocean. <laughs> and and also, can I just say, um, it's a threat that morphs throughout the time where it is a thing um, because uh, it morphs depending on what Nathaniel thinks he can get away with, basically, without immediate retaliation from Bartimaeus. It starts out being, hey... You're of the class of spirit that will get you put on a list to be used in America 100%. I can keep you off the list if I, one, have access to the list with, with, um, by gathering more power, and two, keep summoning you so that nobody else can. <laughs> yep. And Bartimaeus is like, ugh, fine, I guess. And then over time, that morphs into, if you don't do what I say, I'll put you on the list myself. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Like it, so, it, it definitely is an it escalates in yeah. a very clear trajectory. Yeah, and so it's this mix of like the torture of not being dismissed <laughs> in combination with threats and coercion. And at a certain point, Bartimaeus is like, whatever, put me in the American campaign, I'll die, and it'll be over, and that'll be fine now. Yeah. Because I I literally can't anymore. Um, yeah, I'm, and, I'm, and also I'm done. just it's terrible. A, a note on that: Nathaniel keeps him so long that mm -hmm. he is dissolving. Can't yep. hold a form together. Can't cast any magic. Is literally shrinking and disintegrating pretty much before Nathaniel's eyes, and he comes limping back <laughs> to him. Uh. And it's basically like, I did it. I did what you wanted. Please let me go. I'm going to die with or without you, essentially. Um, and Nathaniel's like, oh. Oh, right. I, at heart, am not the most terrible person, and I actually care. Okay, fine. Go home. Rest. You know? Yeah. And it's just... It's, it's one of those things where, like, he lets him... He dismisses him, and... Every magician around him is like, what are you doing? Just torture it. Just get the information out while it's still alive and you'll kill it. We know it'll, it'll die. But you have to punish it for not coming back alive, well, healthy, and just telling you the info. Like, there's a, there is a social stigma in that moment because he didn't add additional suffering to Bartimaeus's life. Yep. They're like, oh, you should have just killed him to get the info. Yeah. Um, and that actually is like a really good character moment for Nathaniel because he kind of, that's where he starts to flip back from just 
this heartless kind of semi-villain into, oh, whoops, no, I actually don't like being like this as a person. Maybe I shouldn't listen to everybody who's my peer. Yeah, like... um That's the first moment the- we see him actually, like, go, oops, what have I been doing? Yeah, like, it's interesting, like, um especially I was referring to the dead naming thing. Mm-hmm. Like, in the first book, he's Nathaniel, but it is a secret and becomes a problem is held over his leverage. In the mm-hmm. second book, the leverage is still there, the threat's still there, but he is settled into being John Mandrake, magician, and totally right. willing to coerce and torture demons. And right. then in the third book, part of his character arc is that he kind of returns to being Nathaniel gradually. Yeah. And, and then eventually is- introduces himself as Nathaniel. Like, it's yeah. not It's not even just, I don't care anymore. It's no, I don't care that this puts the, some of the power back in your hands. It's That fine. doesn't matter to me anymore. It's okay. <laughs> um, That's a good point. Right. Trying to undo some I mean, of this damage. Yeah, like not not in a explicit way, but like that's definitely the the read on it that I had. Mm-hmm. Is that he basically says, I don't care, I'm not going to try and hurt you anymore. So I don't care if you could negate that, you can have this power back. It's fine, whatever. And I also want to point out as far as like Nathaniel character arcs go, I know this isn't really our topic, but mm-hmm. um he the whole reason that he had his name out there for people to find is because he was not a cruel heartless little kid he was a kid who trusted and cared about two adults in his life and so when they said hey i want to care about your identity tell me your name and i'll call it i'll call you it in private Mm-hmm. Uh, he trusted them because he cared about that because he is not this like heartless, ruthless little child. He was kind of created to be that way as he grew up. And so those those moments where he kind of goes, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> it's a very good like we we saw this like too nice little child kind of be shoved into this really just pretty terrible adult. And then, and then it's it's kind of cool to actually see him kind of go, oh, this isn't who I wanted to be. This isn't who I was. I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Um. And and literally and figuratively, kind of go backwards and regress back into how he would have wanted to treat people and spirits as a child. Yeah. I was having. There's a podcast I've been listening to uh, mm. kind of a lot. Um, it's called Embrace the Void. It's a philosophy podcast. <laughs> anyway, because of that, I was having a lot of thoughts about moral luck while uh, <laughs> while reading this. Yeah. And, you know, that's not the topic of our podcast. Uh, but I, I do like the way Nathaniel is handled in this. Um, and, you know trying to stop having Mm -hmm. things where Bartimaeus is just being tortured just by being around trying to make it better this may just end up being I'll I'll save it for the wrap-up I think this is my favorite thing so I'm not gonna say it (laughs) cool um um speaking of I think it's time to head there yeah unless you have anything else nah all right Hey. Oh, hey, Jeff. What's going on, guys? Oh, you know, talking about Superman. Oh, cool. I could talk about Superman. I could talk some more about Superman. We know. I'll bet a few people would want to get in on this. I'm down. You know it. That sounds like fun. I'll do it. Cool. Let's do it. We can call the show Men of Steel. And you can find it at certainpov.com. Or wherever you get your podcasts. Yay. On to the wrap-up and ratings for Ptolemy's Gate by Jonathan Stroud. Uh, For our first topic, our first thing, rating, uh, gratuity rating for colonization. You know, topic one, how the flow of this works. Anyway, (laughs) uh, 
colonization. Um, okay. This is off screen in one way, but okay. It's the, the, the literal colonization is technically off screen. I think. Um, technically, technically. Well, the impact of it is on screen, but the explicit happening is off screen. Yeah, like I don't know. Um <sighs> Okay, the thing we're trying to untangle is is magical British Empire doing a colonization when the entire thing is in London. Um how much of that how And also the past how much the, the past of the other cities that we get brief glimpses of it happening. Yeah. I I, I want to argue mild. Yeah, I, mild is fine. I think it's a, mild. A I of... think the more you know about it in our real world, the worse it is. But if you're just uh-huh. reading the book to read the book, nothing explicit in there. Like, yeah. 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 You could be like, oh, well, it's Britain and it's an empire, therefore it's moderate. Like, right. I don't, I, no. in this particular case for this particular story, I don't hold with that. I don't think that that is a good way to indicate to a reader what to expect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you about mild with a bunch of off screen. All right. Classism. Oh, it's severe. Uh, severe. People die. It's severe. <laughs> severe. Yeah. Um, torture also <sighs> severe it's also severe yeah <laughs> no yeah it's torture porn. Say, mod- we're supposed to agree with the magicians when we are seeing it from from their perspective <gasps> oh no you're right hey i feel like we should have like a bell or like a, a something <laughs> that we ding whenever we finally have that as a gratuity we, rating we put a sticker on the podcast episode when it comes out so it's a shiny <laughs> episode uh, we just color it don't. yellow don't Talk hold enough. me to that. I don't. I don't. That's <laughs> not going to happen. That's not going to happen to everyone. The, I don't know how uh, how we could make it happen. There are podcast players where oh. it shows the individual graphic for each episode. Oh. We, we put in an individual graphic. So if that's how someone's podcast player works, then they will get to see that. So we could release the shiny episodes. We could. Ooh. We're not. Okay. We are. Right. We're not. I, I am saying no. Because uh, then we'd also have to go back and fix it. And I don't want to. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I yeah. No, you're supposed to know by listening to the wrap up. Dang it. That's what we're here for. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, but yes, uh, finally at long last, cause it's been a while. We do have one where not only is it torture porn, it's torture porn for torture as the actual topic, which isn't necessarily what we mean when we put torture porn as the gratuity rating, because that could be our rating for right. a different trauma. Um, but no, it's there are times where we're supposed to sympathize with Nathaniel, especially when he is inflicting when like a magician is inflicting things on just like unnamed spirits, like especially then, right? Just we're at least supposed to under to understand their mindset as part of understanding how it's bad which is like uh, one one of the more complicated things that's going on this is one of the milder depictions of torture porn but still i i do agree that it is to that point all right uh trauma integral interchangeable or irrelevant for colonization uh it's the background fabric but i actually think it's irrelevant because yeah we could it's either irrelevant or interchangeable because it would be very easy to just Mm -hmm. pull classism and make it really substitute for all of the i agree i feel like the reason that it's there is because this is magical britain but if this were a second world fantasy novel we could have pretty much the same thing without having pulled colonization into it hello robin come back which i think is an argument for interchangeable because you would have to swap something 
um, because making it a second world fantasy oh, no. would be a pretty severe change. Uh -oh. um, so I, th I think I do uh, agree with you about it being about it being uh, interchangeable. Okay. Then for classism, uh, it's integral. I don't, I don't think we can. Definitely, definitely integral. No. It is literally the fabric surrounding the things that are the other stuff. Yeah, like you could absorb some of the colonialism colonization with classism, but mm. you couldn't do couldn't the, other the other way. Around. way. Yeah. Um, I also think it would be very hard to have colonization without classism. Like that's part of like the thing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, that's a much more philosophical discussion. Uh, but the <laughs> that, that but, makes me flash back to the very little bit I know about Roman history and conversation. <laughs> which, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Rome's then Rome's for... concept of once we have conquered you, you're our people now. <laughs> and is or at least the little bit I know about it is probably the only time that that even happens. Anyways, moving on. It's still not anyway, positive. I would. Uh, there's still anyway. There's still classism in it. It's just weirder and different and not mapping right, the right, same right. as modern whatever. Anyway, right. uh, back to uh, the book we talked about. That uh, for all that this series dips back into history, I don't think it said anything about Rome. I certainly didn't notice it. Anyway, uh, for. The third topic, which is torture, I... I think this is also <sighs> integral. Yeah. Because... I, like, that's the whole point. If is... if the thing that happens that in, is, inter is explicitly torturous it wasn't torturous, a lot of the motivation of some of our fabric of the world would disappear. Yeah, like, the whole point of the book would be different if that wasn't how it worked. Like, it would just be an entirely different book, basically. Hey, Robin. Yeah, no, I, I do agree with you about... Um, I do agree with you ab about that, that you couldn't have this book without it. Hey, Robin. Uh-huh. We need to stop this recording and restart after you restart your computer and the internet. I switched to my phone. Just now? Yes. Okay. So, you'll need to cut this interlude, but yeah. my audacity is recording and my phone is letting me talk to you. Okay. All right, coming back in. Yeah, so definitely agree that it's integral. Uh, now, as for the care rating, um, for colonization, <laughs> I think this is actually treated with a lot of care. For colonization, you do? Well, okay. So it's, it's low on detail, which sometimes translates into care and sometimes we uh -huh. don't think translates into care. Um, because of the way you asked the question, I feel like you're maybe more on that second one. No, um, I, well, okay, here's my thought process. The, the explicit colonization that we see is brutal. <laughs> um, there's not a lot of it explicitly on screen, but what is there is just no holds barred, no shying away from it. It's usually integrated with more either of our other topics um it's just not there's no punches pulled um i i, I honestly want to argue no care just because we never get we, we never get explicit care taken we have nothing or slam you in the face there's no in between yeah like you may disagree with then that but that's no 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 i i it, it's a hard thing where it's like they didn't have um they didn't 
have a lot of detail. And so that can either feel like com- mostly aligning over the topic in a way mm. that might be bad or not spending a bunch of time talking about a thing that the book isn't going to be able to try and fix because it is too big. Um, right. So if you would rather put it as no care, I am fine with that. Like, I, I see how you got there and I'm fine with that. And we generally, with the care rating, we try and err on the side of saying that it's lower if one of us thinks that it's lower. Right. I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I, good with that. I think that it's too aggressive when it is there to be anything with care taken. Okay, that's fine. Uh, classism. I think it's got a lot of precision and not a lot of care because the point <laughs> is talking about it uh, being bad. Right. The The point is slamming you over the head with how terrible it is and how much it is hurting, is hurting everyone involved. Yeah. yeah. Very much so. Okay. Um, the torture I'm less sure about. The torture I also think is no care. We get explicit okay. descriptions of how painful it is and the things that it does to everyone involved and they're pleading for mercy and like it's not oh no you're right yeah 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 as as the partly partly because of my aphantasia as the descriptions are more visceral and more concrete it is harder to for me to parse the care rating because my brain Mm. does not supply the pictures and so right a description of how bad the classism is hits me much harder than a description of a torture scene. It just does, just because of how right. my brain works. So, yes, I will happily defer to you on saying that this was no care. um, Because my pr- brain was like, shh, that sure was a paragraph of description. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is very, very yeah. visceral. It, espe- yeah. Especially for characters who canonically don't have a, like, default physical form. It gets super visceral. It's very, very evocative good- of what is happening. Nope, yeah, and there's... I I think in my head I was doing a little bit of a comparison to, like, what felt... Because in this one, a lot of it is that he's still just on the plane. That was harder for me to parse out. Mm. But... Um, whereas in the second book with, like, the confinement interrogation scene. Right, right, um, right. Comparing it to that, this seemed less, but I can go with you on no care. Um, purposefully so. But. Yeah. Yeah. Then for the moral directionality. Very clear. Uh, <laughs> Hyper it's very clear. Crystal clear. Yeah, it's clear. Um, and the trilogy is the journey of Nathaniel discovering that, which is, like, really, yeah. really cool. That, like, no, actually, if you wake up and look around and go, are we the baddies? You should do <laughs> something about that. Yeah, uh, it's, are we the baddies? How come you didn't get that five years ago? How dare you? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Book Book um, one opens with opens with the mook summoned me and it was painful like it's hyper clear it's bad and you should feel bad <laughs> yeah literally then, uh, as bartimaeus screams yeah. every five minutes absolutely then for the point of view for the trauma and aftermath uh so okay i want to make a is... comment on this before we actually rate it sure um this book is split between first person and third person omniscient. Mm-hmm. We have yep. one narrator and two points of view, and then three points of view three. eventually. Yep. Um, but it is still explicitly all the same narrator. <laughs> yeah. Um. I just going to assumed this. actually that the third person sections aren't Bartimaeus. 
Oh, I um, I thought that they were because it's still, or or at least so it's, it's it's author third person omniscient. But we still have one P- yes. POV. We still have Bartimaeus's no, no, no. insight into everything. Right, but like you know, he doesn't chime in on Nathaniel's sections. That's more well, no, because he's not there usually. Thinking. Right, exactly, and so it's it's not something that he learns later, and sometimes like. Anyway, I, it's I have encountered other books with this split. Hmm. It is always interesting when that happens. Sometimes <laughs> they're really good, like this one, and sometimes it makes it feel like only one character is the real hero in a group that is otherwise seems like they're supposed to be roughly equivalent. This hmm. doesn't have that problem. This is no, because in this book uh, we have our one true hero and our perpetrators. Yes, uh, and that's perpetrators <laughs> and complicit others, and yeah. yes, uh, I agree. Uh, but yeah, so with the point of view for the trauma and aftermath, because it is third person omniscient for Nathaniel and Kitty's sections, we do still get their thoughts, especially with Kitty. Like we get her thoughts specifically about the classism mm-hmm. um, and different things, but. Um, so it's a mix of, uh, with, especially with torture, it's a mix of mm-hmm. the perpetrator and the victim, depending on the scene and what's happening. But the focus is very much that this is the story that Bartimaeus is telling for as much yeah. of it as it's possible for him to tell. I do like, I like how it plays out here. Yeah, other mm-hmm. books... It, this split doesn't always go well, but I think it's done well here. <laughs> uh, for Trope Spotter, uh, we have Ascended Extra. So Kitty is originally in just a couple of scenes in the first book, and then she's a point of view character for the second and third books. Mm-hmm. I don't want to. Sp- say or spoil any more about that but just that you know she very briefly shows up and then she matters a whole lot to the overall structure of the entire series in a really really cool way Mm -hmm. all right what was your favorite non-traumatic thing about the book i love the character arcs i love especially for our three main characters with as many avoiding spoilers as much as possible i love that they end up in the same place they started (laughs) Um, mm-hmm. and it's not a negative thing, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, without naming names, without tying them to anything in particular, in the vaguest of terms, we have three characters who undergo a severe arc. One of them starts out this incredibly empathetic, just wants everybody to be happy, doesn't understand why it's not that way, becomes cold and bitter, <laughs> and then ends up the most empathetic and the one who's taking care of everybody else. Character two starts out believing in other people for once. (laughs) Loses that entirely is convinced it will never happen again. And how dare you mention them in front of me ends up trusting. And that is what furthers the plot. The third character ends up believing or starts out believing that it's not the system that's the problem. It's the people who are doing bad things. R- becomes more jaded, kind of cynical, thinking, oh no, it is the system. And it doesn't matter how much somebody wants to do something well. The system won't let me and it's going to kill us all. Ends up at the end with going, no, the system is perpetuated by people. People have the power to change that system. And if we we can do it, if we actually bother. <laughs> um, and that is not the explicit thing I like about their character arcs, but it is the vaguest terms that I can give. Um, and it's just really well written. It's really interesting and it's really good. And, you know, most books, if you hand it to somebody and say, hey, the characters end where they began, they'd be like, um, okay, that's th- what, it, what happens then. <laughs> um <laughs> And this book just does a really good job with having characters that feel very true to themselves the entire time, but that undergo growth and change and 
kind of weirdly find good in the world in the worst way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't normally like books where characters are happy at the end. Um, but this book does a really good job and it just has like, it, it does, it takes everybody through this kind of hope. Oh no, it's terrible. Oh, okay. We can hope again if we actually work together and bother to try kind of thing. And also if you like, like gothic imagery and like, not gothic as in both gothic as in like the time period, but also as in like middle school goth. This is a good book. Good series. Uh, my favorite non-traumatic thing about the book. I'm torn because one of my favorite things actually probably actually is kind of traumatic. Uh, <laughs> Because it is, it's a character's, it's a character that we never like, and we're never meant to like, and it's their last stand before dying, but it's just this beautiful moment of like, oh, okay, you're kind of like a terrible person, but Mm -hmm. you're like a consistent terrible person in this really particular way that is narratively interesting, even though I would not want to hang out with you or talk to you at a party. That would be a terrible experience. Um, but as a character to read about in a book, okay, no, that was pretty cool. Like, uh, didn't work out for you. Uh, so right. anyway, so I I really do like that, but I also recognize that as a character's last stand, um, that doesn't quite fit our non-traumatic uh, category <laughs> for this. So yeah, well, um, I really liked Ptolemy. I like how he's handled in the flashbacks and just like his rapport with Bartimaeus is really cool. Like I really enjoyed those sequences. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So that's it. Um, Any final thoughts? Uh. Hmm. No. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so that's it for Ptolemy's Gate by Jonathan Stroud. Uh, just in case you jumped straight here to the wrap up, we did kind of spoil a bunch of stuff randomly across the entire trilogy in our yeah. main discussion. So uh, <laughs> beware. Whoopsie. But also, like, it's it's book three. Um, yeah. And I'm putting a comment to that effect in the show notes. It, it's, so. it's the third one published. It's the fourth one in continuity. It's yeah. hard to... This is These books are very, like, individual separate stories. But actually, really, it's just a long epic. So, yeah, it, it's hard. You know, it's hard if we talked about the third Lord of the Rings book. We would have to mention the Shire, you know? <laughs> it's yeah, hard to... Yeah. You can't really pull it apart entirely with, and still talk about the characters. And our discussion wouldn't have been as good if we limited to just what had happened in book one, which is why we didn't do that. Yeah, Um, for sure. We we both have read this trilogy like Mm -hmm. several times and (laughs) enough uh, so that I can pull every spirit's name out of my head. (laughs) (laughs) And I did three or four times in the discussion. And I'm not good with names. That's not a good thing for me. It it was nice. I think I I think I even mispronounced her, her, her honoris. Heronius? Heronius? Yeah. Anyways. Well, now you have. You said it like several different ways. So one of those is wrong. One of them's right. It's fine. Heronius? <laughs> uh, All right. Probably well, Heronius. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode on Ptolemy's Gate. And we will catch you next episode. I'm going to check it real quick. <laughs> it is... Oh, there's... Wait, what? <laughs> Hornarius. Honarius. Oh, I was entirely wrong. Oh, cool. Oh, no. <laughs> All, All right. right. Anyways. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.
All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. Our transcriptionist is Heather. You can find her on Twitter at MamaDragon20 or on TikTok at MamaDragons underscore Den. We're proud members of the Certain Point of View network of podcasts. Check out all the Certain POV shows at www.certainpov.com. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash books that burn. If you can't wait for the next episode and need even more book-related content in your life, check out our book review blog reviews that burn subscribe to the fortnightly newsletter or follow us on the story graph you can contact us by email at books that burn at yahoo.com and find all our links contact info and social media on our card books that burn dot dot co don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and remember some books burn you